Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to let uh, those of you who are in Dr. Boaz's sections that she will be putting up sign-up sheets up here. So after the lecture, you come and sign in on one of those sheets. And Ziffy will have my sheet wherever Ziffy is. So be it. Okay. A couple of years ago, we lost one of our most important speakers and stalwart supporters. Lillian Judd was a remarkable woman. She was in Bergen-Belsen. She was in Auschwitz. She was sent on a death march. She endured some of the most horrific things we can imagine a human being going through. And she turned that experience into something profoundly positive. Her mission, which she carried forth for decades, was to tell her story to people like you. And those who heard it would never forget her message. They would understand what had happened to her, why it had happened to her, and how it could very easily happen again. Lillian gave her last talk to this lecture series at the age of 91. She stepped in without hesitation, very typically, when someone else had to cancel, and she again delivered one of the most moving presentations of the semester. As always, her son Dennis was at her side for guidance, support, and an occasional prompt. Dennis enhanced Lillian's story with his own account of his experience as a second generation survivor. Since Lillian's passing, Dennis has done a truly remarkable job assuring that his mother will be remembered and that her message will continue to be heard. A very important part of that accomplishment is the film that you're going to see today. Lillian, I'm sure, is very pleased and very proud. Please welcome Dennis Judd. No, how about now? Great, well I'm Dennis and um, I feel honored to be here to talk to you. Uh, I want to thank Diane for inviting me second, second year in a row now, so that's good. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself and about what it was like growing up. Um, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, which is part of Los Angeles. It was back when there was dirt roads there. Uh, I'm dating myself, but it was, it, was a, it was a different place, a different world than it is now, not, not as crowded. Um, my mom, Lillian, and my dad, Emil, had immigrated to the US from Czechoslovakia after World War II. So they were both Holocaust camp survivors. They survived the camps. They met after the camps and got married, and then after about three years, they were able to immigrate here to the United States. Um, my older brother, Irv, um, he was born in Czechoslovakia, and he came to this country when he was two years old. Um, he was eight years older than me, and as we grew up, we just thought we were typical kids growing up in the San Fernando Valley. We'd go to the movies, we'd play Little League Baseball, we had friends of all religions, it didn't really matter. Um, and it wasn't until probably after the, um, after when I started working with my mom on her book that, it, that I had to start thinking about, well, what was it really like to grow up as a second generation? And one of the differences was I didn't have any grandparents. They were, both sides of them had been killed in the concentration camps. Um, we were missing so many of my aunts and uncles yeah, that were gone, they were killed in the camps, and so many of my cousins. We had one cousin that had survived, he was 14 at the time, and then after him, there was like a 15 year gap of life before the next cousin was born right after the war. So I was the youngest of all, of all the cousins. So we grew up with a, um, there was like a, a missing piece of life of our family that was there. We also didn't have any family keepsakes or anything from Europe. Um, everything that my parents had or my grandparents or before, you know, even older than them was all gone, taken or stolen. So when my parents came across to this country, they came with basically $20 in their pockets and nothing else, and they didn't speak the language. Um, I remember as we grew up hearing the stories that my dad would tell of what it was like back in Czechoslovakia and when we would complain as kids about going to school and having to walk to school or whatever, he would tell us the stories about how far he had to walk to school and 
how deep the snow was when he walked. And, and, and each year as I got older, the uh, distance for him to walk to school got longer and the snow got deeper. But it's okay, I understood what he was saying <laughs> at home. Um, I also remember um, growing up, being woken up so many times by nightmares, by screams in the middle of the night. My parents would wake up, we'd just be screaming and screaming, reliving what they'd experienced in the camps. It was a scary time, and I used to have to go wake up my dad, be careful not to get too close because I didn't know what would happen, but, but it was a routine that we just had. So that was another piece that I think set us apart from other typical families growing up. It was after one of these nightmares that my mom had that she decided she needed to start writing down her story. We get a little emotional here. Um, so she began typing her old story, her story on her old manual typewriter back in the 1980s. And um, over the many years that she spent typing her manuscript, um, her stories of what she experienced, um, I started to notice that my mom was able to transcend and to become an, a nicer person, an easier person, a happier person. She, as she would put the stories down in the paper, she would, it would basically be lifted off of her plate. She wouldn't be carrying it with her anymore or to that extent. So it made her a lot nicer, easier person or let go of a lot of the anger that she was carrying. Um, as this was going on and she started to do that, she then, she and my dad both began, became uh, able to start to tell their stories, to talk. And she started talking to the schools, to students at schools originally in LA because that's where she was living. But then I moved up here in 86 and they followed shortly after and um, they started talking to the different schools. So at least a good 20, 25 years of giving talks. Uh, my, my father passed away in 97, and um, you know, so my mom, my mom was alive until 2016. So there's a lot of stories, a lot of students that she touched, and um, it's been really special. Um, we worked on her story. Let's, let's put the film. We worked on her story. Um, it took her like 20 or 30 years to write her manuscripts. It took me 10 years to pull it together into the book. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a labor of love and of challenges, but it was very special. And um, this was the book that we pulled together, and I believe it's all available to the students here. Diane, is that correct? At the super, super duper discount rate. And uh, I guess you've all got that, uh, that information. Or if you want to buy some here, I have some here. But this is, you know, we've been, we were invited to um, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. to do a book presentation. Let's do a slip, another photo. We were invited by Senator Feinstein to meet with her and have breakfast. And she was really sweet and ha invited, her to, uh, invited us up to her office. Um, it was just a special time in Washington, D.C., and uh, my mom was saying, God, she never would have ever imagined while she was in Auschwitz or, Buchen or bergen Belsen, or any, any anywhere in those concentration camps that she would ever be s meeting with a senator in the United States of America. And it was real special. Let's go to the next one. So here we are at the, at the uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum and we're signing books there, and it was just amazing, the crowd that of, of, of the kids and the different people that came, the students that wanted to get, get her book and talk to her and hear her story. It was, a, it was a special week that we spent in Washington, D.C. Um, back in 2010, around 2010, I realized that we needed to get something a little more documented about my mom telling her story. It was a little bit more clarity and detail than her just being up here being our one. Uh, you know, videotaped. So I hired a production crew that came and they ended up s videotaping her. We sent her up in her hap at her house and it was about a four and a half hours worth of tape of, of digital, digital uh, recordings. Um, so that was pretty special. And I was gonna turn that into a 20 minute little blurb so I could promote the book, which I never did. Um, in 2016 in February, uh, when we were walking here for one of the, s one of the presentations, right when we hit the steps, um, my mom collapsed. And um, she couldn't say or move or anything and the paramedics came and they, they took her by ambulance to the trauma center and they determined that she had suffered a stroke and thank God they took her there because then they were able to take her to San Francisco and 
it was a it was a rough time, and um, they did a surgery. On, uh, they removed the blood clot, but anyhow. Um, for many months, mom kept trying to get better. So she had, she, it affected her speech, it affected her ability to walk. And she started working on it, getting better. And, she, and um, it was a long process. And a lot of people came out together and said prayers for her and so forth. It was really special. But then in, um, and while that, while that was happening, uh, Professor Lori Lippman, who's a university professor at UC Davis, had asked if there's anything she could do to help. And um, I think she thought it was like to come over and help her be with my mom. And I said, well, what you could really do to help me is if you could figure out how to take this four and a half hours of recording and turn it into a 45-minute film that we could then show to the students and mom could still come up here. She might be in a wheelchair, but she could at least be part of the presentation and not have to say it. And um, Lori pulled it off. She was able to get UC Davis, uh, students at UC Davis to pull it together, and they put this film together. Um, so that was real special. I was able, thank God, to show it to my mom while she was recovering. But in May of 2016, she suffered a double stroke, and it was uh, too much for her. So she passed away on June 6th. So she joined my brother and my father. There was a, lot, a huge outpouring of love and sorrow from our community. And um, we had the, uh, the funeral, and it was, it was in the Jewish Jewish funerals, um, when you place the casket into the ground, then you go and you shovel three shovelfuls of dirt into the, on top of the casket. So I shoveled the first three on, you know, there's this big long line, a couple hundred people had showed up. And I was sitting under an awning, they had set up in the shade while people were doing this. And um, all of a sudden I started seeing people pointing up to the sky. Wait, let's flip it again. And they're pointing up to the sky in the sun. It's the middle of the summer, and it's, it's June. It's, there's no clouds, and it's hot. And it's like, all of a sudden, they're just, everyone's just pointing up. And this ring appears around the sun, which I had never seen before. And to me, that was a message from mom saying she was OK where she was at. So now what I'd like to do is show you my mom's film, and then afterwards, I'll have a little bit more to say, and we'll be able to talk and answer questions if that's okay. And one thing that we have now that we didn't have last year, so you, you all can be happy, is we have captions. <laughs> so you should be able to read it if you don't understand what she says. To me, it's never been an issue, but <laughs> I heard it was an issue to some people. She has a little bit of an accent. So if we can start this film, this would be great. My name is Lillian Jod. I was born in Czechoslovakia, Ushorod. I'm a Holocaust survivor, and I, I, um, I would like to thank, thank you all for inviting me to, to speak to you, especially your teachers and the principal and whoever. I would like to, pre I would like to make the presentation so that you would be with me, come, walk with me. At first, before I go any further, I would like to ask you to get rid of your hatred. Don't carry your hatred in your heart. Get rid of it. Talk to your teachers, talk to your counselors, talk to your parents, even to a policeman. Just don't carry it because it will turn into hatred. And hatred brings prejudice and, and, and other bad things to your heart. So get, out, get it out and start now. I was 14 years old in 1938 when I completed my high school. And I was ready to go further schooling. For, to, to study for a further for some 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 job secretary or something and um, but, but the Hungarian the Hungarian army came in under Hitler and, and it changed the whole situation and life was hard they were all kinds of all kinds of different orders and intimidation passed all the time 
we didn't know what brings tomorrow, but we heard something like they right away uh, uh, established a forced labor camp, and the boys from the the camps used to come home for two three days on weekends, and they were telling us about how they were killing the Jews on the Polish border, and made the Jewish people stand surrounded around, stand around it and undress. And then no sooner they were undressed, they didn't have much time to think about it because the SS <coughs> started to machine gun them down from every side and they were just falling into the hole. And, the, 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 and as soon as the, all of them fell in, the bulldozers started to shovel the dirt back at, at them. Some people said, the Polish people, after the war, that the ground was moving for a long time. Later, to dehumanize us more and more, they gave out orders and we had to wear the yellow star on our outer garments. We could not go out, leave the house without them. And that will announce that I'm a Jew. The intimidation orders of departure or relocation came, started to come regularly. And as in a few couple of weeks, it became a reality that we will have to leave. We came out to that point where we had to meet. When I saw that sight, it made me sick. I can never forget it. Those little eyes, the children, the old people, so desperate, so, so sad. They, were, they had tears in their eyes. They were scared. They didn't know what to expect. They ne never told us where we're going or why. They just took us. Or then they gave us orders to stand up by five to a row and start marching. We arrived somewhere. And there I looked up, and there was the old brick factory. And then the guard said, now, here you are. This, is, this will be your ghetto. And they opened the gate, and you go in. They did open the gates, high gates, high fence gates. They were all brought in, the children, the old people. And they were sitting in there, and they had some straw, straw under them. And it looked like a zoo. It was terrible. They were all so wild looking. And we came in and we didn't have where to sit, where to go, because those things were filled. So they just pointed out a piece of the cement or whatever there was the, of the ground and told, them, told us that here, this is where you have to go and build yourself something, some, something to, to sleep on there. And this was. For six weeks, we ran out of food, we ran out of everything. And, and the, there was, and we, were, we were in the ghetto. We didn't know what's where. Sometimes, most of the times we, in the evening, we sat together on the lawn talking. There were a lot of people there that we didn't know. But we made kind of, made, we, we talked to them and we, talked to the people, and we made kind of friends. Then, end of the six weeks, came, came, <coughs> came out the, the, Hungarian, the Hungarian soldiers. They picked us up and said, you get ready for morning, take all your have, everything you have, and and go and line up on, on that, that corner. And kept on doing this until there was a whole transport, a whole bunch of people. I didn't, we didn't know them. So we were, we were asked, that stood out there, then we were standing up five to a row, and then a bunch of this little Hitler Jugends came. And they all had a switch. And the, and the leader said that you have to, 
you have to move on because, uh, because, because if not, those kids are here to help you with the switch. So I was just worried about that because he couldn't walk fast enough. So I said, bend, bend on me, lean on me as much as you have to, and I help you and we'll go faster so that we wouldn't get hit. And we did, all the way until we saw the railroad station. We, we looked up and we saw there these black cars and they were all open and as far as I could see to either side, they were covered, the, 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 they, were, they were full of them. And all of a sudden they started to say, get in, get in for us. So we didn't expect to be in the in in animal wagon, so we, it took us time. And we go into the wagon, we take the little bags that we have, and we, we are, there are so many people there that we can't, we can't even sit down anymore, or hardly. And they packed like this all the wagons, and at the end there were left over people, so they pushed in more and more to be into each wagon. Now they, I hear them closing the gates, and I hear the wheels starting to screech, and we're on our way. No water, no food, no, no toilet facilities. We're just going. We don't know how long, we don't know where. And then we stopped, because they were taking in, I don't know what, whatever they were running the, the train with, they were taking in water and coal and I don't know what. <coughs> and we were waiting there. And I looked, looked out on that station and I saw there the men that were working there, happily smiling that they see the, the, the Jews going to be killed. Because they knew where they were taking us, we didn't. So they took us to the, and they, they, they showed us like, this is where you're going to be killed and all that. So it depressed us and that they were so happy about it, even depressed us more. And the thing went on, and then we were further going on the train. And we stopped again. I look up, we're in, still in Poland. But I saw the people on the station, the working people. They were so sad. They, were, they had tears in their eyes. And they're looking at us, and they knew where they're taking us, so that's why they were very sad. These were the same people, same country's people, Poland. And the first group was happy to see us being killed. The second group was sad and cried for us. I learned something there. I learned that you cannot judge a whole country for a group of people or two groups of people. In the same country, they are good people and bad people. So at this point, we're going further. I don't know, how, I, mean, I think it, we were on the road already four days and nights. And I hear the, the, the train slowing down and stopping, screeching to a stop. And when the gates opened and I was standing there, I lied in front of me. I, I thought I'm going blind from the sun, from the light that came in from outside. But I went, we went with, and they were hollering at us, somebody, the Germans. Hurry up, get off the train, Not, without the packages, get off. And then Dad, I had Dad to come down from the train, and he was still holding that little thing, that little bag that he was holding with his prayer objects. And the Nazi saw it. And he came over and he turned the, the, the rifle butt around, 
the rifle ran and with a butt he started to hit him. Over his head, over his shoulders, pretty soon the blood was just coming out. And I'm standing there and crying and looking and I don't know what to do. And I just said, stop, stop. But he didn't pay attention to me. And he just beat him up, until, beat him until he fell. To me, he looked like dead. And probably was. And <clears throat> he was still ready to hit. And I said, why did you have to kill him? He didn't do anything. And he turned around. And those eyes I never forgot so full of hatred, so full of ready to kill like an animal's eyes. And he left, lifted his thing, his rifle, butt, and said, you want to go with him? And I looked up at him and I turned away and pushed myself between the other people that were already gathering up from the other wagons. And he just motioned to two, two uh, prisoners and they ran over, and they, they were in striped uniforms. They ran over, and they picked up dead. Each one of them picked up one of his feet, one of his foot, and, and he was dragging them down on that uneven ground. And his head was bouncing and, and leaving a bloody mark all the way to the truck that they were taking him, and then threw, threw him on the truck. And I never saw him again. <clears throat> After my dad was murdered, and I came from, uh, to look for my mom, I noticed that there were no men and just women and children there. And I found them, and I had to force lines, five, and we were exactly five. And mom was on the end, and she was seeing more what was going on ahead. Than I, and she was saying, "Oh, they are, they are separating us. And when, when they, if they remove any any one of you from me, I'm as good as dead." And she kept on saying it and repeating it, and I had nowhere to to consult her. I didn't know what to say. I needed somebody to put their arms around me too, and tell me that everything's going to be okay. But there was no one. So we just kept walking, and pretty soon we came to, a, to, the, to the person that were separating. He was a good-looking uh, officer in white uniform, white gloves, and just very quiet, very calmly moved his finger to the left and to the right, pointing to you and to the right and to the left, and then they, you just had to obey his finger. And that, I found out later, that was the infamous um, Dr. Mengele, Joseph Mengele. And I told my little sister, my, my sister Renee, who was the third, the second sister from me. And, she, and, and I told her, Renee, pull yourself down a little bit so you could go with mom, so she wouldn't be just with the baby. And I don't know if she did pull herself down or not, but she was taken with mom. And I have, the, I have, I have my life to, to, to think about. Did I give her a, the good advice, or did not, would I be better off to be quiet? But at that time, I thought it was good. It was. It was the best thing I could do. They were calling us such wild names, the Nazis. Such ugly, terrible names. But they just pushed and hurry up and go. And there was no place to go because so, we were so close together with the people that walked ahead of me that if I would make a bigger step, I would step on him. And we were walking and walking until we came close to a building, a gray building. 
And when we came across, I noticed that only people only went in five at a time, but nobody came out. So what happened? What's going on there? We found out. We, uh, pretty soon our turn came and we went in. <coughs> and I looked down on the, on the floor and there was thick layer of hair, all colored hair, different shades, different colors on the floor. And about six, six uh, uh, Germans hollering, take everything off, take all your clothes off. And, and I didn't move because I figured, I never undressed in front of men, maybe he's go they're going to go out. So I could undress. Ah, they didn't go out, and I didn't undress. And their helpers, the girls, came and started to pull my clothes off and throw it in the on the floor. I, and I said, why are you throwing my clean clothes on the floor, on the dirty floor? How am I going to find them? She says, you, you won't have to find them. You will just have to, they will give you other clothes. And they just pushed me into a chair naked. And I see, I see her coming, back, coming up with something shiny in her hand. And I look, and it is a shaver. And she comes and she starts to shave my hair. And I grabbed her hand and started pushing her. And I said, what are you doing? She said, just be quiet. Be quiet. We have to do it. And I, I, I couldn't do anything else but be quiet anyhow. So they shaved my hair and every, every hair on my body and everybody else's. Like a rock. And he says, now go into that other room. And I go to the other room naked, just shoes on. No hair, no clothes. I had sh the shoes they let us keep. <clears throat> go, go in there and I look around. There were a few people there already. From, and I figured that's why we never, nobody ever came out after they went in. And then Hertzi came, out, came in. And she looked. I started to cry when, she, when I saw her. I couldn't see myself. There were no mirrors or anything for to see how I looked. But when I saw her, I started to cry. What did they do that to that beautiful little girl? She was a very pretty little girl. And she, they, they cut her dead hair and naked. She just looked terrible, and I looked terrible. And we both started to cry. All of a sudden, the cold water was opened and we were getting a shower. At first it shocked us, the cold water, but then we enjoyed it, how good it felt after four days to get washed, finally washed, washed up. And they were hollering, now are you, are of you out for sale upper? We didn't know what sale upper was. We did not have a towel, they didn't, some girls said, how come they don't give us a towel? <laughs> we had to dry, dry outside. It was so cold outside. I was freezing. I thought my bones were freezing. And we, were, we, had, to start, start, we had to stand there naked. That was so embarrassing, so dehumanizing. And on the other side, further, much further, on the other side, I saw the men, they were taking the men, probably to, the, to do the same thing. And I, I, I just said, God, please make me invisible. And we were still standing there until finally the, they, they let us go. They led us into the building and they said, now you come and you get some clothes. And, and um, those were clothes that when they had later, I found out about it, that later they had uh, the, the, the selections and some people were already not fit for work, so they took them to the crematorium, to the gas. And, and, and those clothes that they took off, 
from those people and giving it to us. We, came, we were lucky that we got the water, but the other groups got the gas at the same place, and then the crematorium. But we didn't know it at that yet. So anyways, we, we were marching. We were put together and we were marching to one place, and that was the sea lager called. And there, in number 32, we stood, and that's, that's where we, that was supposed to be our home. Now we have to wait until the block supervisor comes out and receives us. So I was looking at, at around what was there, and I saw there a big building, and on the building there was a small piece of glass window. And I could see the, all, the, all the naked heads there. And I said, which one am I? And they all looked like monkey. Which monkey, which, which monkey am I? And I'm looking, and I couldn't recognize myself. Then I went like this and like this, and I recognized myself. And then I started to cry, because now I saw how I looked. So then we were standing some more longer, because then, then she took us in and she said, my name is Edith, and I'm from Slovakia. And, I, and, and, and I'm here for four years already. And you will do what I tell you or else. And here are my 12 helpers. They all had heavy canes in their head and they would hit, had the authority to hit us. Ten minutes later that we are there, we all jumped up and we ran to the gates. And the broker came out, the work supervisor, and says, what do you think you're doing? What's the matter with you? you she says, and we said, we want to see our, pair, our family. And she says, you can't. Then go back. And they pushed us back to the box. And about five minutes later, they went into their little room, and we jumped up again, ran to the gates. This time she came out, and she says, so you want to see your family? And we said, yes. OK, and she take us a key. And we thought, how could she change so fast? Before she wouldn't let us see our family. Now she's opening the gate and she's going to let us see our family. Wonderful. She opens the gate. We saw, we saw outside was dark already. And the smell, such an obnoxious smell, made us feel like throw up. They were burning the human flesh. And that smell, that smell is, is terrible. I look up, I look at, at, the, at the ceiling, I mean at the sky, and it was a vivid red. The whole sky I could see was vivid red. And all that redness came from the crematorium that was there next, not, not far from us. And I couldn't figure out, what, what is this? Where is, where is that redness coming? And, and I'm just waiting, like all of us, to, to be taken to it to see our family. We thought they were in another barrack. Then she says, you want to see your family? Yes. Look up. There they are burning. And she pointed to the sky. And then we believed her. We believed that they were there burning. Because we smelled it, and we saw the people going, more and more people going there. And then we started to cry. And we were pushed to the bed, and we were crying all night. We didn't want any dinner. We were crying all night. Then we were there about a, a week when they called us out and said, extend your left arms. Stand up and stand in one single row, and we had to pull our sleeves if we had sleeves up. And somebody with a, some woman came with a something that looked like a fountain pen in her hands, but she started to 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 make, push, push it into my arm, 
It didn't feel like a fountain pen because it was hurting and the blood was coming out and the ink was mixing with the blood. And I said, we're surely going to get some infection. And sure enough, in two, day, two days later, <coughs> it was infected. Well, we had no antibiotics. We had, nobody even looked at it. It just, they couldn't keep it clean. There was no water. It just, by nature, it healed. It dried out, and we have the number. From then on, we were the numbers only. Finally, they found us at work. They were in between, always calling for, for selections, and they were always separating us. And boy, that was so scary, especially like I have my sister, so I didn't want her to, to be taken away from me. So I always put her in front of me, and I always thought that if they're going to put her, I'm, I'm watching which way they're separating us, if, they, if I see stronger people on one side, and the weaker on the other side, I'm going to see how, where her she goes. She goes to the stronger people when I flex my muscle, which there wasn't much. And if, they, if I see her go to the weaker side, then I just let go. That's what I decided to do. But thank God I never had to, because it, and we always went the same way. Then we were taken to another place, and we, they were choosing people for where they were supposed to make cloth. We took three, uh, three, three cut uh, rockets and one, one, one rubber. We made a knot on the end and hooked it on the nail on the table. And then we had to braid it like, like you would braid hair. <clears throat> there was a big long table, chair and chair for everybody. And in front of each chair, there was a nail knocked into the table. And we, they gave us a quota how many meters we had to do a day. And we were trying it, and I was so slow at it, and I was trying so hard. I was always the last one to finish my, my quota. And they were always threatening us, if you don't finish your quota, they put you out and keep the hose with the cold water on you, on you until you freeze to death. One day this lady comes over to us. They came there with three daughters and they, and they were, and she says, you know kids, Yom Kippur is coming up. How about let's do something so we could keep Yom Kippur. And, and uh, she says, let's make a little bit extra extra toward our quota every day, so we would have the quota completed. When, when, and we, we, we all did that, even I. And we would just keep doing it, and I never found out what we were going to do with it. But we were doing it, and then Yom Kippur comes. We were pretending to work, but, she, but the couple noticed it. And she noticed it by the girl, Two, two chairs away from me. And she came over and she started to go like this, looking, what do we have here that we don't, there that we don't work? And she found her bundle, her bundle. And, and she put her, what's this? And you, you're not working. And she beat her up so that the poor kid had, could hardly talk afterward. And they beat here like this on the head so that the head felt like it was flying off. She came to the next to me, the girl found hers and beat her up, came to me and beat me up so that I saw double, triple. And then I just said, God, why? Why, God? I'm, I'm following your, con your, your, your law. I'm following your commitment. No, what's the word for it? commandment. What am I doing wrong? Please at least take her strength away so she wouldn't have enough strength to beat Hertzi up. Because <coughs> Hertzi was a cup with chest. And sure enough, she came to, after me to the next one and beat her up. And then she says, 
What are you doing to me? I am got any strength. I am I can I, I can't go on. And she says she ran away. So thank God the God listened to me and stopped her before Hertzi was beaten. Because after this I had mixed feelings of as, as far as religion. I was beaten on Yom Kippur because because I tried to do what the right thing, and, and she was, Herzi, but, but Herzi was saved because I asked God for it. We were struggling like this until, until, end of, until December. Brakel Teste gave us orders to, to line up for Tzelap, and we didn't want to go out, we rebelled. And then the, you know, the Nazis came with the gun, and started to shoot in the barracks. They took us to the shower, they shaved us again everywhere, and we were ready to go someplace, only we didn't know where. We, are, we got in, in in those boxcars, and they gave, even gave us a, a bucket of water. And then pretty soon, we made one turn with the, with the, by the track, and we look up and it says, welcome to, we're stopping and it says, welcome to Bergen-Belsen. That was a dead, deadly camp. And we stopped and we were getting out, tired, hungry, cold, and there were no place to go. There were buildings there, they were all occupied. And the cement there, they pointed out a small little circle. This is where you stay. Somebody, and I was so sick already, because I had a bladder infection, and, and I was very sick, and there was no place to even wash. I said to the to, uh, to girls, to Hungarian girls, and to my sister, because by then we made friends. I said, I am getting out of here. And they looked at me, they thought I went crazy. Hmm? Wouldn't be surprised if I did, but no, I really wanted to get out of there. How are you going to get out of here? I said, I don't know yet, but I want to get out of here. I don't, otherwise I would die here in this place. And I don't want to die after what I went through in Auschwitz. So we, we dropped the subject and we were just sleeping on the, on the ground, on the cement. Then a couple of mornings later, we went out for a walk, <coughs> four of us. And I saw there a man standing in uniform, in um, civilian clothes, nicely dressed, and a few women are standing in front of him, and he's, he's, uh, he's selecting. Hey, there is our chance. As I'm going in the line. He, she says, what? The older girl said, what if, uh, if they take us to a worse place than this? I said, I don't think there is a worse place anymore than this. And I'm going, and whoever wants to come with me, fine. If you all want to stay, that's, that's do your business. They followed me, all three, my sister and those two sisters. We stood in line. And they were selecting all the Hungarian sisters to the right to go, and, and, and Herzi over there, and me, they pushed on the other side. I don't know what they were looking for, but me pushed on the other side. And I'm pushing myself back, quietly, sneakily. I am pushing myself back, because I don't want to stay here. I was the one who wanted to get out of here. And I'm pushing myself toward my sister. And I wanted to go in with before the man noticed me, says, hey, I thought I told you you go to the other side. I yes, yes, but my sister there in, in uh, German. Oh, okay, you go too. You go to your, with your sister. So that was so sweet of him. I, I kind of changed my mind somewhat about the Germans. And every now and then something good was done to me by a German so that I thought there must be two, two kind of people there too. These miserable killers, murderers, and, and some 
between them are still honestly good people. So anyhow, I went together with my sister. They took us someplace we never knew where, in a covered truck. But when they put us down, it was a, it was a factory, no name on it. So I don't know where I was. It was like a condo, and we got one bed for two of us, and two blankets. So that was more comfortable. Then they brought us every week beautiful, clean, not new, but clean clothes. And they, and they brought us in the food from the, from the restaurant. And they said that here, we want you to be treated humanly. And they did treat us humanly. And, and, and we want you to survive. And you know, we weren't human anymore. We were like animals. Some of us worse than others. Some of them even went on the, on the lawn, and everything was so nice and clean and orderly. And then we were telling them not to do that, and slowly it straightened out. And we, we were there, and we were taken, we were really taken humanly. We were, we were treated good. But then came the order to evacuate. Then we had to leave. And then we started to march, and we were marching and going with no aims. They don't know. <clears throat> the Germans, Nazis don't know where we're going. We're just going. And then all of a sudden, we, caught, we hear the siren. Didn't mean anything to me anymore. But the Nazis were hiding and said to us, run, run and hide and don't come up until we get you. I grabbed Herz's hand and we were running, 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 running. And we come up to a, to a field that was covered with uh, maybe broccoli, not completely grown. And we sat down there and we are waiting and we are, and then we saw the broccoli and we went to it and we ate it and ate it and ate it. We were kept taking the top off and eating it. I don't know how we didn't get sick from it, but I bet the, the farmer got sick when he came out and saw all, the, <laughs> all his crop go on. Yep. Anyways, <clears throat> we came down and all the transport is gone. Nobody's there. What are we going to do here? So we started to walk, and there we saw a house just above us, and there were some people standing and talking about the, about the alarm, about the air raid. And we went up there and asked if they would give us something to eat. And they just didn't even look at us, just walked into the house without even anything. So we're going further. Then I even went to the police station yeah, to ask what to do. And, and they said, well, why don't you go after the transport? Because we have, no, we have no place to put you, to send you. And you know what? We were thinking. So we have our freedom. We don't know what to do with it. So we went and joined back the transport. <laughs> And it was okay because some of them didn't, didn't even notice that we were gone. And we were just marching toward more. And then the, the SS were standing around by themselves in, in a circle and started to talk quietly, whispering among themselves. And then <clears throat> we are on the, on the paved road where there were forests on each side. And the essence started to holler, run, run, run. Didn't explain why or what, what they want, just run. And we didn't move. So then they came with a rifle and started to chase, scare us and chase us. And, and when I saw her coming with a rifle, I grabbed her hand and jumped into the forest 
and we, run, we, we, we were running, 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 I don't know where we got the energy, but we ran. And we came to a clearance, and there I saw a man working. And I went up and I asked in German, could you please give us something to eat? I didn't know how many people were behind me already. And he fed us. He says, I only have milk and bread that I can give you. That's great. We didn't have milk since, since home. So he fed us the bread and milk. Then I asked him, would you please tell us what part of the world are we in? And he says, this is the Sudetenland. And the Sud I knew that the Sudetenland was part of Czechoslovakia. And I started to talk Czech to him. And the girls behind me said, tell him that we're going to work for free just for food for him. And he says, no, it's no need. You are free. The war is over. That's the first time I heard that the war was over, and you can go home. They, took, they came with the ambulance and took us to the hospital, and then we were checked out and given beds and some clean clothes. And then we were put to another place where they were, we were kept for weeks and fed, <coughs> and fed um, oatmeal in the morning, in the, at noon, and at night. And then we started to walk home. It was a long time to get home because the trains, the tracks were bound every here and there. So then we had to walk or whatever, which way to, to get to the next train station. And so it took us a long time, and I, meantime, developed a fantasy that my mother will survive and will wait for us at home. And I was strong right from the beginning of my, of my um, concentration camp time. And I was so sure in it that my mom will come home. And then we were, we were coming home already. A lot of things happened on the way and all that. Finally, we are in our own hometown, and some people recognized us and came out, and they weren't sure, but came to talk, and as were our parents and sisters. And we told them, and, and then we go up to, my, to our property. There I look up, there, I, there, there we, we went to, the, to our pump, and we sat down there, and Kai Herzi went to knock on our door. Nobody opened it. So we, start, we were crying outside, and then somebody called out, go away, this is not your house anymore, it's my home. I don't even know who it was, but from, I think it's from Russia. They brought in some people and took our homes. And then I said, Mom isn't here. God, why did I survive? Mom isn't here. Our house, they won't let us in. What, are, what am I going to do? No hope. What, am I, what are we going to do? What are we supposed to do? And then I look up, and I see my neighbor across, from across the street, the gentle neighbor lady come up, running toward us with tears in her eyes and says, come kids, come to my house, I'll take care of you. And she did. I had this nightmare. I had nightmares all the time. But this nightmare came up and I woke up screaming and in tears and scared because they just, I just saw the, my dad was killed there and I saw that blood and everything, so, so real looking. And I couldn't stop crying afterwards, I kept seeing it. Usually a nightmare just, once I wake up, it goes away. This one didn't want to leave me. And I thought to myself, I, I better sit down and write about it. 
because I want I want to get rid of it until then, before, and then I decided that next morning I had an old clunker typewriter, and I started to type. I took typing classes, and so I was able to type my story. And as I was typing, at first I didn't think it's going to come to me what to write. But it was coming so fast that I couldn't type it fast enough. And pretty soon I put out everything from my heart, everything that bothered me, everything that was laying there. And each time I covered a page, I completed a page, and the page fell down on the floor because I didn't have the thing, it felt like something fell, fell off my shoulders, on my chest, and I was able to breathe better, and I felt better, I felt easier. And until I finished, I wrote it down. I didn't know what I'm going to do with it, but I wanted the story. I wanted the story done first. But then, when I started to, to, to write, then I kind of felt freer to talk about it, because until then, I couldn't talk about my experiences. And, and after I was writing the book, just after I started to write the book, I felt free. I could, I could talk about it. you enjoyed or you appreciated the film um, just one second so I wanted to talk a little bit about the Holocaust and in reality we're really at a challenging point in time regarding the Holocaust <coughs> the last few remaining survivors are soon going to be passing on they're not going to be able to, to physically tell their story, to answer the questions that the many students would ask of my mom. And lastly, there'll be no one able to give a hug. Um, during the past times after my mom would talk and tell her story in person at middle schools, at high schools, at colleges, there'd be a long line of students that would line up to want to give her a hug, take a photo with her. Um, they, there's a lot, of, we got letters, thousands of letters of people that were touched so much by listening to my mom talk to, tell her story. And so I think the next phase now is what I'm taking on is for the second generation to carry on with the personal memoirs and stories and the feelings that have resulted because of the Holocaust. Um, I think it's important to understand that you can't just say six million Jews or 20 million Russians or however many millions of people were killed that's, it just, it, it makes it, it gives you a broad brush to wave over everything. And the reality is each individual had a personal story, had a personal impact. And it's not just them that have the impact, but it's also their, their heirs, the survivors, the kids that survived, um, the, victims the, the victims' children that have survived, the second generation. It's impacted me, it's impacted all the survivors. And... So it's, re it's really important that, you know, and I'll go into that a little bit more, but what the important message for all of you to understand is, is it's really important when you see something that's going on is wrong to not just be a bystander, because I think that's a piece that was really, what, what, that's what really allowed a lot of the Holocaust, a lot of genocides to occur, is when people, in the, when the population just looks the other way or doesn't want to get involved. And it's scary and it's life risking, but you can still do something, not to risk your life necessarily, but to point it out, ask for help, especially in this country if you see something. So it's important to take steps to try to make a difference. And each one of you can.
to make a difference because individuals made a difference. Be it the, um, you know, the person, the, the, uh, so the, the individual civilian that was making the selections, he made a difference for mom. There were a lot of other examples which were in the book of even Nazi officers that made a difference, that they took it upon themselves to do something right, even though they were in a bad situation and they could risk their lives. So that's an important piece to understand. And it's under, to understand, you know, to understand all of that. I think, I think a part that was, that's also important is to realize it's not just the offspring of the victims that are impacted and changed for life, it's also the offspring of the perpetrators, especially in a situation where the perpetration, the perpetrators have admitted what they did. So in Germany, German, the German government has admitted, German people have admitted that they took place, that they created the Holocaust, that they were involved with the Holocaust. And I, I my hat, you know, I have, I have a level of respect for them. I never thought about it before because I didn't want to have anything to do with Germans as I grew up, but I appreciate that more and more now. Um, and especially a um, couple of th small little stories. When we were, mom and I spent a lot of time we would take a break and go to Maui, to Hawaii, stay in a condo there, and we would work on the story together. And one of the times, she fell down some stairs and, hurt and injured her knees, and we had to take her to Kaiser. And Kaiser in Maui is different than Kaiser in Sonoma County. Kaiser in Maui is friendlier, it's easier, it's more personable. Um, it's amazing. And um, they don't even communicate with the Kaiser <laughs> here in the, on the main line. But for the most part, we had to get x-rays and we're going into the x-ray room and there's this blonde lady probably in her 40s and she's got a big smile on her face and she's like welcoming us in come on in and getting mom ready for the for the uh, ex to do x-rays and you look on the walls and there's these beautiful drawings of children that have been there to visit her thanking her and all this stuff it was a really personable and she, she let me come with my mom for the x-ray and so I got to go in the back with, with the x-ray technician. Mom, they put moms on a table. And then she comes back and I was back behind the glass door with her. And she's going to take the x-ray and I look at this happy, cheerful, pleasant woman. And when she comes back, she's not happy. She's not cheerful. She's really upset. She's disturbed. Something, something, something happened and I didn't know what. And then I watch her go back out to readjust my mom and then she points to her tattoo. And she says, you were in Auschwitz, weren't you? And her mom says, yes. And then the lady says, she asks my mom and begs her for forgiveness. My mom says, forgiveness for what? You weren't even alive when the Holocaust happened. And she says, yeah, but my uncle was one of Hitler's confidants, one of his advisors. And my mom says, well, you're not responsible for something that your uncle did that was wrong, that was evil, that was bad. You know, you had nothing to do with it. But she carried that. She carries that with her. So she's impacted by that. And that kind of hit me. I didn't, I never thought about any Germans being impacted by what their parents did during the Holocaust. And, and then we're flying back on an airplane, on the airplane back to California. My mom's sitting in one seat. I'm sitting in the middle. And this younger woman, a little dark complexion, sits next to me. Nice, attractive woman. I'm talking to her. And where is she from? And she says, I'm from Turkey. And I'm going, wow. So my personality goes, so we start talking, I start to ask her about the um, Armenian genocide. What's her, what's her thought about the Armenian genocide? And her opinion very strongly was, there was no Armenian genocide. We never did anything, the Turks never did anything to the Armenians. It was the Armenians that attacked the, the Turks. We were just defending ourselves. And I realize I can't really talk to her much more because her country has not ever admitted and acknowledged what Turkey has done and did to the Armenians. So you have all these people growing up and living in a denial situation, and that's one of the aspects which you'll be taught about as far as what, what involves genocide is ultimately denial that it ever happened. Turkey is definitely part of that. So that kind of hit me comparing that with Germany. It was like, wow, now I'm, I'm liking Germany even better. Who would have thought I'd say that? Um, a few weeks later, I was at a healing center retreat, and there was a, a German lady that was also there, 
younger woman, probably in her late 30s. And um, we had just finished the book. So when I was talking to people there, when I would tell them, oh, I do real estate redevelopment or I'm an environmental, you know, my master's is in environmental health. Nobody was really interested in that or hearing anything about that. But when I talked about the book, then we also just wrote, wrote this book. There was this excitement that people wanted to hear about the book that I wrote. So I was talking to a couple of ladies in one of the, one of the, uh, in the little gift shop there. And I was telling her the story about what my mom went through and so on and so forth and got into quite a bit of detail. They didn't really understand, they didn't know that much about the Holocaust. When I got done, I turned around and who's standing right behind me? It was a German lady. And she looks at me and she asks me if, you know, it's like about 12 o'clock by then. She says, are you gonna go to have lunch? I go, yeah, I'll go to the cafeteria and have some lunch there. And she says, can we go together? And I go, sure. And we start walking together. We walk outside into the middle of the, the park area to get towards where the, the other building is for the cafeteria. And she says, did you know I was German? And I go, yeah, I could, I could tell by your accent. And then she said, she starts breaking out in tears, crying, and she starts asking me as a second generation to forgive her for what her family had did. And I was like, well, what did your family do? Well, my father, he was drafted in the army and they just used him as, as cannon fodder to charge against a hill and he was killed in, in World War II, his, her grandfather, I forget what it was. But it was, she was so impacted also. She, she didn't do anything. She wasn't even born then either. And she's asking me as a second generation to forgive, which was really impacting me. So, so it carries on, and I think it's important to understand that. And um, that's something that's hit me pretty heavy. Um, there's got to be healing and forgiveness on both sides of the perpetrator's families and on the victim's families so we can move forward. Um, I wanted to say a couple, two, two more things. I wrote them down if I can find it. One was that when my mom arrived and her family arrived in Auschwitz, it was the one time that a Nazi officer had a camera and was taking photographs. And so these were put together. He took a bunch of photos of that train load coming in and then it was hidden with his girlfriend and then ultimately it was, she found it, she, she submitted it to Yad Vashem, which is the uh, memorial uh, museum in Israel, and it published the Auschwitz album. It just so happened that that particular train was the train my mom's family was on, and one of the photos that was shown on, on top on the screen was a photo that they took after they murdered my grandfather, but when my mom is together with her mom and the three sisters. And so my grandfather was murdered by the, by the Nazi soldier right after they got off the train. My grandmother and my two youngest aunts were marched off to the gas chambers. And my mom and the next younger sister, Herzi, is who were chosen for slave labor. And basically the Nazis were, were looking for those who, those people who could be good slave laborers. They used, they used the Holocaust, they used this Holocaust experience to not only take the property, to take the money, to take the assets, whatever they could take from, from, from the Jewish families, but they, um, losing my thinking, they, um, they chose the, the people who could be good slave laborers. So if you were probably over 30, 35, you were already too old to be a good laborer, so you would go off to the gas chambers. If you were younger than 15, 14, around there, you were too young you would go to the gas chambers. If you were a mother with younger kids in tow, they would send you to the gas chambers with the kids because you wouldn't be a good slave laborer if they took your kids away from you and murder and gassed them. So you ended up with this, with this group of people within the strict age bracket. So that's why my grandparents aren't there. That's why we have a 15 year gap of time from the, yet the oldest cousin that survived and then the next, the next cousin was born after the camps. So I think that was an important thing to understand. And then um, Yom Kippur, have you ever, how many of you know what Yom Kippur is? How many of you don't know what Yom Kippur is? <laughs> Yom Kippur is a Jewish holiday. It's a, it's a, it's a very, um, it's a very special holiday. There's a bunch of rabbis in here, so they can probably, one's asleep, but, <laughs> but you can help me out. Yom Kippur is the day 
it's, it's after the new year of Rosh Hashanah and when we're praying for um, forgiveness and we're learning to forgive and asking for, to forgive others that we may have hurt or upset during the, during the year. And we're trying to get our lives in order and to become better people for the next year. And that's the day when you are written in the book of life, health, happiness, whatever for the following year that God puts that down in our prayer, in our religion, that's how we believe it. And I'm simplifying it tremendously, I'm sure. So that was, that was during Yom Kippur, you also, it's a fasting day where you don't eat or drink. So that's where my mom was taking upon herself during the time that she was working to, to make the extra quota so that they wouldn't have to work. So they were trying to get by without having to work. So that, and they, were, they also had asked their the person that was that was giving out the food to save the food for them till the end of the end of Yom Kippur, which that person said, "You guys are crazy. You're starving now. You don't want to eat anything." So it was that was part of that religion, part of that aspect of the holiday. But there's a lot of pieces to my mom's story that are there's, there's a lot more to it, which was written in the book. Um, it's hard to put it all into the, into 45 minutes, but um, I think that's pretty much where I'm at at this point. I don't know if there's any questions. If there are, I'd love to answer them. And I'll learn to turn off my mic when, when I hear. Do you turn it off first, or how do we do it? Uh, first of all, oh. First of all, thank you for sharing your story. I think this is like really important work that you're doing. Um, I had a question about the uh, two individuals that you met. You were talking about the German woman in Hawaii and uh, the Armenian or Turkish woman you met on the airplane. And how much do you think that in Germany it's illegal to deny the Holocaust? Is my understanding. Uh, it's a German law. Um, if they don't have something similar like that in Turkey. What sort of a difference do you think it makes in people accepting that the Holocaust was something that occurred and the descendants taking culpability for the sort of atrocities that took place as opposed to uh, the people denying the Armenian um, genocide? Okay. Um. Is it working? Okay. I, I don't think the descendants need to take culpability about what their previous um, generations did. I think it's important, though, that they understand that and they know that and that they're more aware of what happened and how it happened and that they, they realize we don't want this to happen again. It was wrong. And I think that's a big piece that Germany has, do, has done versus Turkey hasn't done. I mean, there's all different stories of why it hasn't happened and I, I don't know part of its rep reparations that Germany has paid paid some money has paid funds to the survivors there's just different things but I think it, it I think it's healthier for the for the the survivors of the perpetrators to be aware of what happened so that they they can move forward and hopefully help make the world a better place too I think it's important, and I'm thinking of this myself, is it's probably important for the uh, second generation people like me to maybe hook up with the second generation people of the Germans and be able to start to get a dialogue going to move forward on a positive, peaceful level too. I don't think that's possible with Armenia and Turkey because Turkey still hasn't, you know, they haven't acknowledged what they did. And I think that's, a, that's kind of where my head's at. Does that answer your question okay? Okay, there's got to be more hands. <laughs> I have two quick questions. One, how long was your mother in the camps combined? And do you know what the braided piece work that she was doing, what that was for? I left the phone on the floor. We don't know what the braided piece work was for. Um, they didn't know what they were what they were doing for. And she did other, there were other camps that she was at doing stuff too, which she didn't know what they were for. Um, 
How long was she in? She was in the camps for probably about a year, maybe a little bit more. We've got the records. We were able to get the records of, um, from the Jewish, um, from the Holocaust Museum. They, they had attracted, the, they had gotten all the records from, the, from Germany. Um, I think she was in Auschwitz for probably about eight or nine months and then transferred over to um, Bergen-Belsen for, I guess, a couple of days. And then from there, the camp that they took her to was Flossenburg. And that's where that factory was, is near the Flossenburg camp. And I think part of what I'm going to do, because st I'm still wanting to fix, to, to make the film better, is to start showing some maps in there to show where, where everything's located, where the death marches were, and so forth, that I can find out. Um, oh shoot, uh, how did your parents meet? Because I know that after your mother and her sister came back, she stayed with the neighbor, but how long was she with the neighbor? And then when did she meet your dad? This is working and I'm not shutting it off, this is good. So basically, um, after, I don't know how long she was with the neighbor, it wasn't totally long, I mean, it was enough for her, she, they cleaned her, she cleaned them up and gave them new clothes and <coughs> showed them love. And then the, there were some Jewish funds that were coming out that were setting up places for them to live. So my, my mom and her sister were able to get an apartment in Ushorod or Unvar, which is the, the town that where she was from. And so she was living there and as she describes in the book, she was upset with her sister who didn't want to help cook any food, who just went out to go meet the guys or whatever, or, you know. So my mom was upset having to cook some food by herself, trying to get this wood stove to work, which she couldn't really get to work very well. And then her sister comes in with these two guys, and they're both dressed really nice with, you know, hats and mustaches, and they look really good look, you know, one was really good looking. And she's watching them, and they, they come in, she, they introduce themselves to her, and one comes to go sit on this, they had a Hollywood bed that they had found that someone had left over for them. And it had a big hole in it, in the middle of it, or a part of it, and she had spread a blanket over it so you wouldn't see it. <laughs> and so my dad came walking over and he went to sit down on the couch, on that little couch, and he sat right in the hole. So he went down, his legs went up, and my mom just busted up laughing. And that's how they met. <laughs> And so um, the relationship evolved as they were getting out of Ungvar. Ungvar was in, was in um, the Carpathian mountain area of Czechoslovakia when um, it's a moving country basically. When my grandparents were born in the same place, it was part of Hungary. When my parents were born, it was Czechoslovakia. After the war, the Russians came in and they basically just chopped that piece right off of Czechoslovakia and that became part of the Soviet Union. It was no longer Czechoslovakia. So when that was happening, and my dad saw what was going on, he did not want to be part of the communists and be part of, get stuck into that situation. So they all, all the family, all the people that we know, well, most of them, they, they went west. And so my dad ultimately met my mom again while they were getting back into the, in the into the western part of Czechoslovakia, and then they got married, and they lived in Tisa, which is like a nice little, a nice town in the, in the Carpathian Mountains. It was beautiful, or it wasn't in the Carpathians, but it's a beautiful place. So they met there, they got married, and there's whole stories about how that happened, how the rabbi didn't come, and my brother, and the, my dad's older brother did the, perform the wedding, and then afterwards, mom found out that he didn't have the right to perform the wedding, and they had to, <laughs> so she was pissed. Anyway, there's a lot, of, that's good stuff in the book, let me tell you. So um, that's kind of how they met, and how, how they did it. My dad was a very strong man. He was very, um, typically not following the Jewish format of what most of the men were in Europe. He was a drinker, he could fight, he could hold his own or more, and uh, the Gentiles appreciate, respected him. They need not to mess with him because he kicked their butts. And so he developed rapport, and, and he was in the labor camps for 
about eight years, right when the Germans first took over Czechoslovakia, my dad was in the Czech army, and as soon as they took over Czechoslovakia, when England, you know, met Mr. Chamberlain had peace in hand and, and gave away Czechoslovakia to the Nazis, um, at that point, all of the Jewish soldiers, the armies basically became part of the Nazi ar German army, and all the Jewish soldiers that were there were immediately put into war camps. So they were separating out men who could be, who could be laborers. And, and basically by pulling the men out, it made the families that were left a lot weaker to be able to do stuff with. So that was another question of how all this could happen. And with my dad, there's a lot of, st I gotta, I'm still working on his book, but a lot of stories of how he survived and what he did. And um, I know when he came, they let him out of the camps because he had done so well there and he got back to Dubrnitch, which is in the hills just above Ugenvar, just in time for the Nazis to come and say, okay, we're now taking everybody you know, to the ghetto and then to Auschwitz. So he stuck with my fam with my with his parents and and the sisters that were still there, and that's why he ended up back in Auschwitz. In Auschwitz. Okay, anything else? I got one. So I'm afraid this isn't a question, but I hope it's okay to say it anyway. First of all, it was just such a pri privilege to know your mom and to recognize the complexities, but also how she consciously did everything she could to destroy hatred in herself and in others, and what a remarkable human being she was. <sighs> the concern I have is that if we don't consciously try to be human, if we don't make the effort, which your mom did make, it's so easy to become subhuman. Uh, the older I get, the more I don't understand how human beings could treat other human beings like that. But I also recognize that it actually takes a conscious effort and I see, I realize it's in a whole different kind of way but you look at it going on in the world today. And if there is any lesson in the Holocaust, it's that if you don't make the effort, if you don't consciously learn what it is to have human values and not to hate in your heart, which is what your mom was such a great example of, if you don't rid your heart of hatred, if you don't recognize hatred in your heart, and if you don't learn to accept the humanity of other people, especially when they're different from you or have different culture, etc., you know, it's not going to go away. And I'm afraid, I, I know there are people who might well disagree with me, but I think I see it going on in our country right now. I see people un unwilling, people in power who are not willing to accept honesty, etc. And And to me, that's a lesson that has to go on. And your mom, you know, making this movie, Dennis, so appreciate the work that you and your mom and your family have tried to devote yourselves to do. And so I'm sorry this isn't the question, but that's the thoughts, you know, in watching this movie and hearing what you had to say. And thank you for letting me say it. That is, you know, right on point of what, what we're talking about and what I'd like to get maybe through better. I'll have to work on that one. But that's what mom did focus on. It's trying to get the members of the audience of the people that you talk to to understand that, that they were responsible. And the first thing is to do within yourself is to, as you said in the beginning, is to, to let go of your, your hatred before it turns, you know, your anger, your hatred, and just to learn to forgive. Um, I think, I think the other part that I learned um, when I was putting the book together, I was looking at the photographs of Auschwitz and I was looking at how can, how can there be photographs, like we, we, there's, there's the photographs of the, um, I forget his name, but he was the commandant of Auschwitz, it's a, his album is, in, is available to look at too through the Holocaust Museum. And there he is, he's lighting candles on the Christmas tree. He's got the, 
his SS officers, they're all singing songs and there's a accordion player and they're laying on chase lounges with the blueberry girls is what they call them that were coming up there. And you look at them and they look like, wow, they're really nice people. They're, you know, they're, they're, they seem to have all this personable stuff going on. Yet at the same time that they're doing this, there's 10,000 people being killed every single day. How can you get to that? How can people do that? How can they justify living their lives, being happy to turn these, and, and, and while all these other people are being murdered? And that was a big question for me. And then it was like, well, and they're just like on the other side of the wall from the camp to where, they're, where they were at. But then, you, then I started to ask the question, what about the, the communities, the towns that were right next to Auschwitz? How could they get, how did they let it go through? But the, you start to take it on and on and on. It's the towns, well, how of Germany? How did Germany do it? Or the people in Germany or, or the people throughout Europe because so many of the countries in Europe, so many people that lived in those countries also participated in, in the atrocities and, and in rounding up the Jews and sending them off and so forth. And then you go to, what about the United States of America? They knew what was going on well ahead of time. Why didn't they bomb the railroad tracks? Why didn't they try to do something? So the question really, I don't know where you draw the line of responsibility. Now it's part of the bystander, oh well, we don't know anything, we don't see, you know. And right now, there are genocides going on. And there's been genocides going on since, you know, before. And it's like, well, what are we doing here, all of us that are here, to try to make a difference? Are we writing a letter? Are we making a call? Are we doing anything? Because those people that are living in the genocide, they can't do anything else. They're needing help from outside. And that's where we have the power to make a difference, or to at least try. And, if, and that, the trying is what really helps and makes a difference, I think. Okay. I was. To, oh. That's really loud, sorry. You're a really hard act to follow, yeah. I think you were, the point that I wanted to ask, I think you pretty much answered it because, you know, your mom's first statement, you know, gotta get the hatred out of your heart, to me was just really profound and I think it's important for everybody here, our, our young students here today, um, it's a very hard thing to do and I kind of wonder how she did that. I think you partially answered that. Um, but was it many years? Was it is it over time? And she talked about every page she did, it was lifted off of her shoulders. But she didn't do that for you know a long period of time after her life. So um, is there something you can impart to us as you know what she, what she did and how that can be given to us? Hello, okay. It was probably 40 years after the Holocaust that she started to, to write her memoirs. So um, she would have probably been in her 60s easily. Um, I guess life gets in the way of that type of stuff, raising a family, trying to survive, trying to make your living, you know, whatever we did, she did, trying to educate herself. Um, and then finally having to have a nightmare to just shake you up and realize that, that there's, this has to come out. Um, you know, when I was going to high school, I remember reading in the history books, and this is about World War II, and there was maybe a paragraph this thick that said that there was a Holocaust. There was nothing that, there was no dialogue. Nobody really wanted to talk or hear about the Holocaust survivors. It was just kind of like, we don't care about that as a society in America and s that, that I recall. And it wasn't until she was you know, writing her stories. And, then I, and it was interesting, I remember her saying, when she would meet people, she goes, I'm Lillian Judd and I'm a Holocaust survivor. And I used to bother her, why do you have to tell people you're a Holocaust survivor? What, you're Lillian Judd, that's who you are. And it took me a while to realize how important it was. And it's also important when, I, when, I, when I'm done with these talks, or I talk to individual people, they're, they're so, they're, there's so many people that are touched by what's going on. And I'm, and I'm finding that on trips that I'm at where I'm either in the, the democratic liberal societies that we live in here, or I go into the, um, the Trump areas, the people that I'm finding that I talk to, for the most part, are decent, nice people. They have a difference in political 
opinion, but for the most part, when I tell them what I'm doing, they said, yeah, that story needs to be, needs to be done. It's just a limited sampling. It's just the people I talked to when I was on different vacations. But what I'm finding is that people in this country, for the most part, are really good people, whether they think one way or the other politically. They're still friendly, they're still nice, they'll still go out of their way, and a lot of people to do something that's nice and right for the, mul for the majority of people. Um, so I'm losing track of what you were asking exactly, or I'm rambling. I think for her it was writing, it was writing it down, getting it on paper, getting it off of your brain, and getting it onto paper. Because once you put it on the paper, I think it's something that you can just start to relax and let go of it, and you don't have to carry it around so much. And I think also with her talking to the students and talking to people and then seeing the responses he's getting from them was also really special to help with the healing. I think people want, people want that, they're needing that. Dennis, I, I want to thank you for it's not doing what you do. And I am blown away by the number of children that you're writing and children of the, of the Armenian genocide who are willing to step forward and tell those stories and the impact it's having in our local community where um, last year about 3,000 students in our local middle and high schools had presentations by people like Dennis and Peter Crone and Christine Davidian and the Batsdorfs, all individual and powerful stories in which we're asking these young people to look at the cost of intolerance. And that's for me the hope. Um, and I know how hard it is to do this work. And I just want us to really honor your commitment to keep your mother's story alive and um, we are all in your debt. Thank you. Okay, uh, who's next? <laughs> the lady, the young lady here. So I was just wondering, since your mother took this journey with her sister, what happened with her sister? Her sister came to America probably a year or so before my mom could come, and um, she married a nice Hungarian gentleman, um, Uncle Harry, and they had three kids, and they lived in L.A., and then when my parents came over, they moved to L.A., and so they, were, they got to be together again, and we were a close family, and my uncle, her, her, her older brother, Uncle Leonard, he was able to leave Europe on the last transport out before the Nazis came in. So his, I have his passport, and it's he was on the Queen Mary. They, he got out on the Queen Mary on the last ship out from France, and it's got the stamp from the French, and it had the Nazi swastika in it because the French were already Nazi by that time. And so he then joined the U.S. Army and was fighting, and so he was also responsible for helping get my parents here. So my parents moved to L.A. and the. And my dad's family, for the most part, also moved, that survived, moved to L.A. So we had a good family of aunts and uncles that sur of the survivors and cousins. And a lot of the other Ungvaris, which are the people that were from Ungvar, also moved to the L.A. area or New York, between the two of them. And so we had a, there was a closeness there that was pretty special. Dennis, thank you so much for that. Thank you. 